Funding for this program was provided by the UCLA Office of Instructional Development. Okay, so I want to talk about cosmology today. And cosmology is the study of the universe as a whole. And the um, interesting thing about cosmology is it's not an experimental science, but an observational one. Because we can't just go down to the universe store and buy some more universes to experiment with. So we have to just um, see what's going on in the universe, and I've been involved in that. And then we want to make sure that the same laws of physics that we can study in our laboratories apply to the universe. So this means no special laws for the heavens. So here I have the, an old woodcut with the uh, person poking his head out through the sphere of the stars to see the gears working the heavens. But the idea here is that there was uh, chemistry that worked on Earth. There were the terrestrial elements, the four elements, and then maybe a fifth element, the quintessence, that only applied in the heavens. And that's the attitude that we don't want to use today. So we want to use the same laws of physics in the universe as we use in the laboratory or on the Earth. And so it's very appropriate now to bring up Isaac Newton sitting under his apple tree and studying the fall of the apple. And of course, Newton did not discover gravity. Everybody knew about gravity. But what Newton realized was that the fall of the apple was due to the same force that leads to the moon falling around the Earth. So the moon is continuously falling around the Earth in a circular orbit. It's always accelerating towards the Earth. And that's due to the same law of gravity that causes apples to accelerate towards the Earth. So it's a universal law of gravity. It applies everywhere. OK, now I want to say a little bit about the history here of what's happened in the last century. And it's really been incredibly remarkable. So in 1908, one of the leading astronomers of the day was Captain. And he thought that what you could see in the um, Milky Way, you could count the stars in the Milky Way. These are counts that was done by an English astronomer, Herschel. And you could see that there was a disc, you know, sort of a discus-shaped cloud of stars with the sun sort of in the middle. And Captain thought that was the universe. So the universe was only about 55,000 light years across. So since that time, the universe has gotten incredibly bigger. So this actually now allows us to come back to the second part of my uh, title, which is we can observe the origin of the universe. This was not possible under old concepts of the universe. So if we go back to the time of my, you know, the woodcut, where you're talking about a size of the universe, that sphere of fixed stars was only about 100 million kilometers away. And the age of the universe was calculated to be about 10,000 years. That calculation was basically based on how long people had been keeping records, and nothing more than that. And as far as anybody knew, light traveled instantaneously. You had an infinite speed of light. So the idea that you can use a telescope and look at more and more distant objects and see further and further back in time didn't really apply to this model of the universe. Because the age of the universe times the speed of light was such a great number that it was much bigger than the size of the universe. There wasn't anything to see that was that far away. So you could not observe the origin of the universe, even though it did have an origin. Then about the time of Captain, the universe was much bigger. People realized that it was much bigger than the solar system. Now it's about 10 to the 17th kilometers. So that's a one with 17 zeros after it. Now, that is still not very big. And people thought the age of the universe was infinite. That it had already always existed. 
So if you have an infinite age of the universe, even though we now knew that light traveled at a finite speed of 300,000 kilometers per second, you have a finite speed and an infinite age. Again, to see the origin of the universe, you have to look out to an infinite distance, and there wasn't anything to look at there. But under the current understanding, our current understanding of the universe now, the size of the universe is about a million times bigger. So you'll notice it went up a factor of a billion, and now another million, and a greater than sign here. The universe is bigger than what we can see. So I already have told you the answer. We can see the origin of the universe. The age of the universe is fairly well determined now, 13.7 giga years, 13.7 billion years since the Big Bang. And the speed of light, of course, is still 300,000 kilometers per second. But if you multiply this time times this speed, you get a distance that's shorter than the size of the universe. You can actually th see things right back to the origin of the universe. And that means it's actually possible to observe the conditions of the universe at its origin. Well, almost at its origin. Shortly after its origin. So, coming back to the idea of Newton, the universe is dominated by gravity. So gravity is the only long-range force that doesn't cancel out by having positive and negative charges like electricity. So gravity, everything attracts. Well, almost everything attracts. And so Einstein, thinking about gravity, made a modification of Newton's theory in 1915. This is general relativity. And naturally, since gravity is very important in the universe, and he had a new theory of gravity, he created a model for the universe using his new theory of gravity. And this was published in 1917. And it was based more or less on what was known about the universe in 1917, which is almost nothing. So there is very little known about the universe. I've already mentioned that Captain thought it was only 55,000 light years across. So even in 1963, moving forward 50 years, there's very little known about the universe. And there's an astronomer named Malcolm Longair, whose thesis advisor was Peter Scheuer. And Longair came in and said, I want to work on cosmology. And Scheuer said, there's only two and a half facts in cosmology. And these were listed as the sky is dark at night. That's a fact. The galaxies are receding from each other as expected in a uniform expansion. This is the redshift, the Hubble uh, law. The Edwin Hubble discovered this in 1929. We'll come back to that in a minute. And then finally, the half fact was that the contents of the universe have probably evolved. And this is related to the controversy between the Big Bang model, which is what is currently favored, and the steady state model, which was a popular model for cosmology in 1963. So what did Einstein actually do? He ignored the first fact that the sky is dark at night and proposed a universe that was homogeneous, filled with stars. So homogeneous means it's not divided into a lump. So there's basically galaxies throughout, but infinite in lifetime. And if you have an infinite age, you can see an infinite distance, eventually your line of sight is going to land on a star. You can look out in any direction, eventually, and maybe a long time, your line of sight is going to land on a star. And that means that the night sky, instead of being dark, should be almost infinitely bright. So I'm not talking about the night sky being as bright as the daytime sky. I'm talking about the night sky being as bright as staring at the sun. So that kind of brightness is obviously not present when we look at the night sky. And yet, this paradox, which is known as Olber's paradox, would not be solved in Einstein's model of cosmology. So Einstein did work out his model of cosmology. So you could make a consistent calculation of what's going on in a universe that's uniformly filled with galaxies. With Newton's theory, it was difficult to do that. But he thought the universe was static, unchanging, uh, so there wasn't anything 
happening as a function of time. And in, over a long period of time, if you have a bunch of matter, gravity is going to cause it to form into clumps. So things will clump together. And eventually you'll end up, instead of with the universe filled with galaxies, you'll end up with a few big clumps. So then the universe wouldn't be static and unchanging. And Einstein didn't want that. So he had to introduce a new term in his equation for gravity, which he called the cosmological constant and denoted by lambda. So lambda is the cosmological constant. And Einstein put it in in order to make a static universe. But when he did this, what he was really trying to do was make gravity have shorter range. So it's a long range force. In Newtonian gravity, a big mass or a big star will attract more strongly than a smaller one. And the force of gravity just falls off as 1 over r squared. It's an inverse square law force. So what Einstein actually wanted to do was to make it fall off more quickly. He wanted to have a force that was proportional to the amount of mass, but would fall off more quickly so the arrows were shorter. But what he found instead, because it was very limited in how he could introduce a new term into general relativity, he found that he had a long-range repulsion force. So instead of just making a shorter range force, there was a long-range repulsion. But you'll notice that at a particular distance, it's possible to balance things so that there's no force. And then the universe can sit there at a specific size and be static. So that worked out OK. And so Einstein published his model, a static universe with a cosmological constant. Now, since Einstein's time, physicists have developed quantum mechanics. And in quantum mechanics, there's a source, a possible source for the cosmological constant. And it has to do with the fact that whatever is not forbidden is going to be happening all the time. And so space-time, this is a space-time diagram here. It's the first of several that I'll show today. So time is running up. So this is a graph of what's happening in you know, space is running across and time is running up. And this is just showing what you know, a little cartoon of quantum fluctuations. These are particle-antiparticle pairs being created out of nothing and then annihilating back to nothing. So they come from nothing and then go back to nothing. So in the long term and on average, uh, energy conservation is maintained, but the vacuum is supposed to be filled with events like this. And then if you calculate the mass that you would get from all these uh, particle-antiparticle pairs, you would actually get a fairly large energy density for the vacuum. So this is uh, a bit of a paradox in quantum mechanics as to why the vacuum energy density is not huge. So in cosmology, we need a small vacuum energy density to have a lambda. OK, so quantum fluctuations lead to a vacuum energy density. OK, and if we have this vacuum energy density, it causes a long-range repulsion. And then you have, as a function of the size of the universe, if it's small, then the attractive short-range gravity, you know, when you're close in, you get attraction. And so if it, the universe is too small, it'll collapse. And if it's too big, it'll expand forever. But if it's just right, balanced right here, it can remain static. Now, if you think about that for about less than a minute, you realize it's not stable. So it's only metastable. So this was a problem with Einstein's model. And it really, you know, this sort of idea of a hill is a very good analogy for cosmological models. Now the total energy, there's a zero point here for total energy. And as you can see in Einstein's model, the energy for the universe, because it's sitting right here and it's not moving, so there's no kinetic energy, the total energy is negative. So if the total energy is negative, then according to the general relativity, the universe has a spherical shape, a positive curvature. Now the sphere that we're familiar with would be the surface of a ball like the Earth. 
and that's a two-dimensional sphere. So you have to imagine a three-dimensional sphere, and that would be the universe. So that means that you could travel in the same direction for a long period of time and come back to where you started. And because the universe is infinite in age, at least in Einstein's model, that was a possibility. On the other hand, if the total energy is zero, then the universe is flat. That's what we currently think the universe is. And then if the total energy is greater than zero, then the universe has negative curvature and is often drawn as this saddle-shaped thing is a two-dimensional analogy. But there were other models that were uh, based on general relativity. And this actually disappointed Einstein somewhat, that there was more than one way you could use general relativity to make a model for the universe. So instead of the theory specifying uniquely one beautiful solution for the universe, the fact that you have multiple models actually means you have to go out and observe things to see what the universe is like. So that's fine for me because that's what I do. I observe things. So De Sitter had a model with no matter, only lambda, and then it was expanding. And then Friedman considered models with matter that expanded from a singularity of infinite density. So we had these models all very early in the history of cosmological models. But what happened in 1929 was that Edwin Hubble, working up at the Mount Wilson Observatory, discovered that faint galaxies, as you look at fainter and fainter galaxies, they're moving away from us faster and faster. So the universe is expanding. This is evidence that the universe is expanding. So this observation then formed the second fact of the two and a half facts that Scheuer listed in 1963. So the expanding universe, and notice what this does. It says that Einstein's static model for the universe, which was unstable and required a new physical constant be thrown in, was just wrong. I mean, it was constructed in order to not have a redshift, and Hubble discovered a redshift. So clearly, the observation then decided that Einstein's static model for the universe was wrong. Now, this redshift is an observation that's made using a spectrograph. So you spread light from stars or galaxies out into a spectrum. And if you take a nearby star in our galaxy and spread its light out into a spectrum, you find strong, dark spectral lines in the spectrum. And these are due to various elements. This is hydrogen, which is the most common element in the universe. And this is ionized calcium, which is a very strong line in the solar spectrum. And then if you go to a nearby galaxy, you find that all these lines are there in the same pattern, but they're all shifted to the red by some percentage. And that percentage is what we call the redshift. So if it's shifted 1% to the red, we say that's a redshift of 0 0.01. And if it's 25% to the red, so now instead of being just shortward of 4, 100 nanometers, it's just short word of 500 nanometers, then that's a redshift of 0.25, 25%. So that's how Hubble was actually able to measure velocities because when an object's moving away from us, you get a redshift. So this is what Hubble found. He found a law that we call the Hubble law. He didn't call it the Hubble law and he didn't call the constant here H. So Hubble used K for this constant, but he found the velocity was proportional to the distance. And that's indicative of an expanding universe. So the Einstein static model fails, the de Sitter and Friedman models would pass. And then as far as Olber's paradox goes, a static universe filled with light emitting sources cannot be static. It will fill up with radiation until it gets brighter and brighter. And so Einstein's model failed the Olber's paradox test. And, but the de Sitter model and the Friedman model were both fine. The expansion of the universe you know, keeps the energy density of light low. And so then when you look at that amount of light, you get a dark night sky. So this was the situation in 1965, two and a half facts. 
and um, a considerable controversy going on between the Big Bang model and the steady state model. And another observation, this one rather accidental, um, settled the question in favor of the Big Bang. And this is a discovery of the cosmic microwave background. So two radio astronomers working for Bell Telephone Labs were working on this uh, little, very sensitive horn antenna here. And this was set up to be able to do communication satellite experiments. And it was designed to be extremely sensitive. And Penzias and Wilson were trying to chase down three Kelvin of excess noise. I mean, the system temperature was about 23 Kelvin. That was the total amount of noise they were looking at. And they expected 20. So there was three Kelvin excess. And so they did things like clean, clean out the white dielectric material from pigeons nesting in here and other things. Uh, couldn't get rid of it. But it turned out to be a cosmic signal, the dominant radiation field in the universe. So it's really almost all of the particles in the universe are photons of the cosmic microwave background. So there's about a couple billion photons in the cosmic microwave background for every proton in the universe. So these are the most common particles in the universe. And for this work, Penzias and Wilson received the Nobel Prize 14 years after the discovery. So this CMB spectrum, the cosmic microwave background spectrum, has a very specific spectral shape. And this is the spectral shape produced by a black body. A black body is an opaque, non-reflective isothermal body. And in the laboratory, we always construct cavities because it's easy to make a cavity that reflects nothing. So if you have a cavity, a beam of light that comes in will bounce off the walls and get absorbed as it reflects back and back you know, many, many times before it can reflect out of the hole. So it's very easy to make an extremely black cavity. Now, if the walls are heated to a constant temperature, this cavity radiates a specific spectrum known as a black body spectrum that depends only on the temperature of the wall. And when you go out and measure how much radiation is coming to the Earth in the cosmic microwave background as a function of frequency, you get these black dots. These were done by an experiment that I worked on called FIRAS. More about that later. So the black dots are data with error bars, which you can't see. And the solid curve is a black body curve. And this is extremely precise agreement. In fact, the average deviation is only 50 parts per million. So if you take the peak up here, the average deviation of these dots from the curve is only 50 parts per million of the peak. And if we expand the um, vertical scale by a factor of 8,000 and then just show the deviations, you can see that they're all very small and consistent on average with zero. So this is very important confirmation of the Big Bang model. But now I want to talk a little bit more about space-time diagrams because I want to talk about one of the peculiarities of the Big Bang model that existed uh, prior to um, 1980. OK. So this is a space-time diagram showing the universe. Now, these little black triangles here are actually meant to be what are called light cones. So here's a light cone. So here's light being emitted. Light travels at a certain speed, and it can travel in many directions. So if you think of it in two spatial dimensions and one time dimension, you end up with a cone, like a megaphone, going up. And there's also a past light cone of light coming into the event. But of course, that's far too difficult to draw these fancy little you know, perspective cones. So what we do instead is just make a little triangle here. So this little triangle with, uh, normally we do space-time diagrams with units of years and light years or seconds and light seconds in which case the speed of light is 1 and corresponds to a 45 degree angle on the diagram. So this is just an example of light cones. And if we look at this model of the universe, this is a space-time diagram of the universe, because the galaxies are moving away and being influenced by gravity and slowing down, 
you get a past light cone. It doesn't look like a cone. It looks like a teardrop. So it starts out as a cone and then comes back together at the time of the Big Bang. OK, so that's the past light cone in a cosmological model. And it looks very similar to what you would get if you were to plot not 45 degree lines, but a 45 degree course on the Earth, a southeast course. So it's 45 degree angle between you know, going straight north, which would be to the future or south to the past. So here's a southeast course. And it curves around the Earth like this. And you can see that this diagram of a southeast course and a southwest course looks very similar to this teardrop. But if we go back you know, down a little bit south on the campus to Bunch Hall and talk to the people in the geography department, they'll tell us that the Mercator map is what you want in order to straighten out those curved paths on the globe into straight lines on the map. So a southeast course is a straight line on a Mercator map. Sailors are very familiar with this. Constant course is a straight line. And we can do the same thing with the space-time diagram of the universe. And like the Mercator map, we have to stretch the time axis as we're approaching the Big Bang down here. And we divide out by the convergence or divergence of these lines of constant uh, longitude. And so this gives us a diagram shown here. And this is called a conformal space-time diagram. OK, so this is a simpler way to plot things. And if we do this for the universe, we get this. So here's the Big Bang. Here's where we are. Here's our past light cone. This is when the universe had a temperature of 3,000 degrees instead of the 3 degrees it has now. And at that point, hydrogen, which is the most common element in the universe, becomes ionized. And you can no longer see through the universe. It becomes a fog. And so we're down here. And so we can see to this spot, then this spot, the gas here, can only see stuff that's inside its past light cone. And so we're looking at stuff that was able to look at stuff here within this yellow triangle. Or we can look at the other side of the sky and look at this spot on the other side of the sky in this yellow triangle. And there's no points in common here. And yet, when we look at these two spots on the sky, we see almost exactly the same temperature. So this is a mystery. Why is the sky so uniform if the different parts of the sky weren't able to talk to each other in the time since the Big Bang to when the universe became transparent, which is when we can actually see things? And this is called the horizon problem. And just to show how uniform the universe really is, I brought this plot. Uh, the AV guy said, is this slide right? It looks like a gray triangle. But this is an honest to god, normal contrast view of the sky. And if you look very carefully on a computer screen, but usually not with a projector, you can see a little tiny structure in it. So this is the three degree black background, you know, the cosmic microwave background on a zero to four Kelvin scale. And it looks completely gray. So there's nothing to see. I usually like to point out that the LA Times had a, an article on the front page complaining about NASA's uh, raising the contrast of images. So I always refer to this as the LA Times version, the one they want. <laughs> But if we do expand the contrast, here it's expanded. The contrast has been enhanced by a factor of 400. So we've really stretched the contrast here. You can see that one side of the sky is, in fact, hotter than the other. And you can also see this line down the center. This, this is the equator of a map. This is a map of the sky. And that's our galaxy, the Milky Way. At least mostly it is. This is a neighbor galaxy, the Large Magellanic Cloud. And the fact that one side of the sky is hotter and the other side is colder is due to the fact that our solar system is moving through the universe. We can measure our velocity relative to the universe. And we can measure it rather well. And so it's actually moving at about 370 kilometers per second. So that's our motion through the universe. And so that's not a just so story. But the fact that the sky is so uniform, why? Why is it just so uniform? 
And so this is normally called a just so story because we had initial conditions that were just so that the universe is so uniform. It's not very satisfactory. It's not really a scientific explanation. It's possible, but it's not very likely. Okay, there's one more just so story to worry about, which is if we go back to the model for the universe as a hill, now with the uh, cosmological constant turned off because we don't, you know, 1975, 1980, we didn't believe in it. We have this problem, the universe is down here at the beginning and we have to give it a shove so it goes up the hill and then coasts on out here. That's very hard to do accurately enough so it doesn't have way too much energy or not enough energy and falls back. It's like this carnival game where you're pushing the bowling ball, you want to get it over the hump here and get it to stay on the other side of the hump. It's very hard to do. And just to show how hard it is to do, if we go back to one billionth of a second after the Big Bang, we would have to have the density of the universe, which is 447 sextillion grams per cubic centimeter, set to a precision of one gram per cubic centimeter. So this is extremely hard to do. So how did we manage to get the universe set so that one nanosecond after the Big Bang it was expanding at just the right rate or had just the right density to survive out to now without recollapsing or expanding too fast? And that was another just so story. So this was the situation in 1980. So the Big Bang was successful, but it had these, you know, special initial conditions that were required. And then a guy named Alan Guth, who was at MIT, same time I was teaching there, came up with an idea called inflation. So this is a large cosmological constant early in the history of the universe. So if you have a large cosmological constant or a large vacuum energy density, it causes the universe because of the repulsive effect to expand very quickly. So you end up with a huge universe. It grows very rapidly. And because it grows very rapidly, if you have an event, this is a space-time diagram, of course, um, here, the future light cone heads out, but now instead of converging, because the universe is expanding exponentially, it blows out. So this event can talk to everything here and way across here, and you can easily send a message that, to the universe, let's all be 2.725 Kelvin. So it's easy to explain the horizon problem, and it's also easy to explain then the um, fact that the density is exactly right. But I don't have a graph to actually show that. Because I want to go on to explain a consequence of this inflationary idea. Remember, the vacuum energy density is due to quantum fluctuations. And if we have a large vacuum energy density, we're going to have quantum fluctuations. And that's going to cause the universe to expand exponentially rapidly. So little tiny quantum fluctuations can get swept up in the expansion of the universe and become great big fluctuations, big in size. So you can have a little quantum fluctuation occurring here and then it grows following, you know, like that light cone. This is a little movie as opposed to a space-time diagram showing a slice of the universe and you can see quantum fluctuations going off all the time. And you can see a pattern emerging here. There's an equal amount of area covered by large circles, medium circles, or small circles in this pattern. And this is just a fundamental way that quantum fluctuations occur in an exponentially expanding universe. So that's called equal power on all scales. And we can actually predict what the sky should look like if it follows this law of equal power on all scales. And so in order to actually measure these fluctuations beyond, so these are much smaller than the dipole anisotropy. The dipole anisotropy that were due to the motion of the solar system was only plus or minus a tenth of a percent of the temperature of the microwave background. In order to measure 
these quantum fluctuations, we needed to measure things that were much smaller. In fact, they turned out to be only 10 parts per million. And this discovery fell to a satellite. This was the first satellite that NASA launched devoted to cosmology, the Cosmic Background Explorer, or COBE. And there's John Mather, and there's me, and there's George Smoot. This is Ray Weiss. I was working with Ray Weiss at, the, um, at MIT. And this is Dave Wilkinson. You should pay attention to Dave Wilkinson. And so this is the science working group. There's one guy who wasn't present. That's always the case. And this is Kobe. And so FIRAS is an instrument here inside Kobe. And there's another instrument here, Derby, which I won't talk about at all. And then the differential microwave radiometer antennas. We're measuring the temperature differences. So we want to measure very small temperature differences. And Kobe produced this map. So this is the um, cold spots and hot spots. And this is the Milky Way. So you have to ignore that. That's local pollution of the sky. But you can see the structure here has a certain statistical nature. And if you do equal power on all scales, you get the same kind of structure. And so this is equal power on all scales. And this is the COBE data. And so the quick chi by i comparison suggests that the equal power on all scales predicted by inflation is actually confirmed by this COBE data. The COBE data was released in 1992. And so Stephen Hawking got very excited about this and uh, made the following quote. Certainly got him on the front page of the Times. It is the discovery of the century, if not of all time. What a great blurb for work that you're doing. <laughs> so. That's one of the reasons I've been concentrating on what's happened in the last century. So you can sort of decide whether this is really the greatest discovery of the last century. But um, that's a real nice thing to say. And of course, Mather and Smoot won the, 19, you know, the 2006 Nobel Prize in Physics. Mather for measuring the spectrum and Smoot for measuring those very small uh, temperature fluctuations that you saw on the COBE data map. Now, the oval in these maps, you know, a lot of people looked at the uh, newspaper and decided that Kobe had discovered that the universe was oval. <laughs> but all we're really doing is making a map of the whole sky, the celestial sphere, with the galaxy on the equator. So that's an optical picture of the galaxy. And this is the same projection applied to the Earth. And I like to use this where I've made the mountains red and the oceans blue, because exactly the same thing applies to that Kobe map. So the red regions, which are hotter, correspond to mountains. And the blue regions, which are colder, correspond to oceans. And the oceans, where the gravitational potential is negative, is where all the matter runs down and collects to make those clusters of galaxies that we see around us now. So that's what I just said. But there's a little bit more going on. We can actually distinguish between two different kinds of matter. So you have the ordinary matter of hydrogen and helium, carbon. Well, early in the history of the universe, you just had hydrogen and helium. And then you have what's called dark matter. We now think that 5 sixths of all the matter in the universe is dark matter. That's some fairly mysterious form of matter that interacts gravitationally. And you have to remember that we've seen the effects of dark matter, the gravitational effects of dark matter, in many, many circumstances. So it's not unobserved stuff. It's just stuff who's only been observed gravitationally. So this dark matter has zero pressure. It doesn't interact with itself. It doesn't collide. It doesn't have any velocity. It's got a lot of density and no pressure, so it actually has zero sound speed. The rest of the matter, the hydrogen and helium, is all ionized because we're talking about when the universe is hotter than 3,000 Kelvin, so hotter than the surface of a red star. And this <coughs> ionized gas scatters photons very strongly, and there's these billion photons, billions of photons per proton, in the cosmic microwave background. So there's a lot of pressure. The photons provide the pressure, and in fact, most of the mass. 
and you get a baryon photon fluid that has a very high sound speed, nearly the speed of light. So the speed of sound is about half the speed of light. And so that traveling sound wave in the baryon photon fluid and the dark matter just providing the gravitational potential and not moving, and now matter collapses to make clusters of galaxies up here, these two waves, one traveling and one not, actually interfere right here when the universe became transparent. So this wavelength illustrated uh, half a period between the Big Bang and recombination. You actually get the two effects. One is from the fact that a dense gas is hotter, and the other effect is that a dense gas has a negative potential well and makes things colder. Well, if you shift the density peaks in the hot gas over by half a wavelength, these are lined up now. And so you get an enhancement in the anisotropy. So you get a special wavelength, a preferred wavelength traveling through the universe, or some preferred wavelength. And if we then say, well, what we can actually see is a sphere like this. We're here, and we can see out a certain distance corresponding to the time it takes light to travel back to this interval. And this is supposed to be a sphere. It looks like a circle, of course, but you know, I've simplified things here. And then if we take this wave and map it onto the whole sky, we get this. So we get a particular kind of wavelength on the sky. But that's not exactly what we expect to see, because we actually expect to have not just a single wave, but a random superposition of waves of all directions, but primarily of this wavelength. And so we actually expect to see a superposition that looks like this, and it has a characteristic bump size. So it's no longer true when we look at smaller scales that we have equal power on all scales. We have a characteristic bump size. And people set out to measure that. The way we um, measure it is a thing called L, which is shown here. It's the number of oscillations, full cycles, that you have going around the sky. So if you have two, that's L equals two. If you have 16, that's here. But actually, the sky is a little more complicated and small scale than that. So the actual characteristic size is about at L of 200 and a bit. So we expect to see a characteristic spot size of about one degree, a little less than one degree, if we look at things carefully. And if we look very carefully, we can actually measure how much temperature anisotropy there is for various values of L. And then we can plot that and see which of these theoretical model curves is correct. And this will tell us how old the universe is, how much the vacuum energy density, cosmological constant there is, what's the density of ordinary matter, what's the density of dark matter. All of these things can be read off measurements, you know, the, the curve here. So this goal of making a better measurement of the microwave background anisotropy fell to this group, which was the microwave anisotropy probe um, science working group. And there's Dave Wilkinson. Now, unfortunately, Dave Wilkinson, he was a leader of the project, but before we published the first results, he died from cancer. And you know, he's got a long history in CMB. You know, the, um, when Penzias and Wilson discovered the cosmic microwave background, there was a group at Princeton that was trying to measure it. Well, he was part of that group. And so he was leading one of the leaders of the project. And so now it's called WMAP, the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe. And in this case, I've actually patched in some of the people who weren't in this picture. And so the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe, instead of having horns like the DMR actually has, you know, parabolic dish antennas, it's like the difference between a megaphone and a parabolic mic. So you really can isolate a very small spot on the sky. And it's made a map like this. This is three different wavelengths, seven, five, and three millimeters. And these are plotted as red, green, and blue. And the interesting thing about this plot is you can easily see the characteristic spot size. 
And you can see that all these fluctuations off the Milky Way are very clearly a grayscale. They go from black to white. They don't show colors. Whereas the Milky Way is reddish. And you can see some red spots off the Milky Way, but those are just other galaxies. And we can actually make a map where we subtract away the galaxy and we get very little change off the Milky Way when we come through like that. Okay, well, we've just released five years of data with WMAP. We launched in 2001 and are still taking data. And this shows the current status of the observation. This is now with the contrast enhanced by 12,500 times. But the Los Angeles Times can't publish this picture. And so then if we study it, divide it up by the, you know, this index L, how much power is coming in various angular scales. Equal power on all scales is a constant straight line here. You can see the COBE data was down in here, and that fits the straight line. But with WMAP, you see this very clear peak. That's the characteristic spot size. And you see harmonics. You actually get overtones of that interference pattern. And then there's other experiments on balloons and at the South Pole and mountaintops in Chile that have done other observations. Everything is consistent. And we get a very well-constrained cosmological model. And this is why we can say so confidently that the age of the universe is 13.7 billion years. I mean, that's the age of the model that fits this data. And also you need to remember that each one of these spots is a fact about the universe. Okay, so we've gone from two and a half facts to hundreds of facts. But there's another aspect of the universe that's important to mention that's also come in in the last decade, and this is the discovery of the accelerating universe. So the cosmological constant is back. We can't get rid of it. Einstein didn't like it after the universe was discovered to be expanding, but now with supernovae, you can always find a supernovae by looking for the um, supernova. Look for the arrows in the sky, right? So this. <laughs> well, what's happened in the last decade is a guy named Mark Phillips uh, invented a technique for telling how bright a supernova really is. In other words, he learned how to read this watt label on the supernova light bulb. And since that time, astronomers have been using this to really tighten up the uh, measurement of velocity versus distance. So Hubble's data in 1929 is shown here, and it's pretty much a cloud through which he drew a straight line. But in 1995, uh, Reese Press and Kurt Kirshner uh, had a graph like this. So all of Hubble's data would fit down in this little yellow box. And it's a beautiful straight line. The Hubble law is very strongly confirmed. But since that time, we've actually, in 2004 now, we've got a um, measurement that goes beyond the Hubble law. We can actually see curvature away from the Hubble law. And all the 1995 data fits in this little box. And because this curve is curving down like this, which says that the, for a given velocity, objects are further away, they're fainter, that tells us the universe is accelerating its expansion. So that's the evidence for an accelerating expansion of the universe, and that's characteristic of a cosmological constant. So it's back. We now have data that require it. And what's going on here is if you have a cosmological constant, the universe is accelerating its expansion. That means it's expanding more slowly in the past, and so it's older. And that means the distant objects, say at redshift 2 here, this is 1, 2, are further away. So here's redshift 2, it's not so far away in a universe without a cosmological constant. And with a cosmological constant, it's further away. So we got this model where there was a large cosmological constant during inflation, then it went away, or maybe it just got small. Now there's a little cosmological constant. And we'd like to know whether it's going away or getting stronger or what. And uh, as a result, NASA and the Department of Energy are planning to build JDEM, which is an ugly acronym in name of a better one, 
the Joint Dark Energy Mission. And several groups are proposing JDEM concepts, and this is one of them. This is SNAP from Lawrence Berkeley Lab. But the, um, NASA needs money. And there's a lot that they're supposed to do. They're supposed to keep flying the space shuttle, which is very expensive, and also build a new manned system, which is very expensive. And they're supposed to do it for no new money, or a little bit of new money. And it doesn't work out. So as a result, unmanned scientific projects like JDEM are really being squeezed. So if you feel like writing to your congressman, they might actually be paying attention now because they're all running for re-election. <laughs> so now, is it the same laws of physics? Are we really using the same laws of physics? Well, it's the same laws of physics, the same equations, but you know, this cosmological constant is really a problem because it's so small, we can't possibly measure it in the laboratory. And so that is a problem. So we're very eager to be sure that the cosmological constant is real, so we're checking it by many different ways. And one of the ways we can check it is by comparing maps of where galaxies are in the sky with the CMB map. So this is a CMB map from WMAP. It's been rotated around a little bit, so it can line up with this map of radio sources measured by the NRAO VLA Sky Survey. And with confidences of better than 95%, up to 99%, and a little beyond, people have found a correlation between the number of radio sources and the temperature here. And that would be produced by the cosmological constant. So this is an indication the cosmological constant is really there. And I'd just like to show my uh, current project, which is WISE, the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, supposed to launch in just about a year, November 1st, 2009. We'll see if we can hold that schedule. And by mapping galaxies out to a redshift of about one, you can do a better measurement of this correlation between the CMB and a better test of whether the cosmological constant is real. So we've made some progress. We've gone from the caveman looking up at the dark night sky and asking where the hell did it all come from to sitting in an office, ignoring the sky and the telescope and wondering where the hell did it all come from. But right now, it's where the hell did Lambda come from? So that's nothing really funny, because that's a vacuum energy density. There's something really funny about the vacuum. So that's the current status of cosmology. So now to come back with whether we're observing the origin of the universe, I'd just like to point out that when we look at these spots on the CMB sky, we're really looking at the mountains and valleys in the universe. These are gravitational potential fluctuations in the universe. And so it's, it's like looking at mountains and valleys in the Sierras. But when you go camping and there's fog in the morning and you can't see the mountains, and then the sun comes up and the fog clears away, then you can see the mountains. That doesn't mean the mountains were just made. The mountains were made millions of years ago and now you're just able to see them. So we're seeing this as it was 400,000 years after the Big Bang. But these peaks and valleys were constructed from quantum fluctuations during the inflationary epoch, which necessarily occurred sometime early in the first one trillionth of a second after the Big Bang. So we really are seeing just about all the way back to the origin of the universe. So we got this funny universe. Um, Ordinary atoms are 4% of it. That's everything that chemistry departments deal with. The other 96%, of course, belongs to physics and astronomy. <laughs> so the chancellor's still here. We should get a budget that's 25 times bigger. <laughs> so I thought I'd close with a little bit about the future of the universe. Uh, this is stuff from uh, Larry Krauss in Scientific American, March 2008, if you're interested in. What happens if the universe keeps accelerating in its expansion? This cosmological constant is going to make everything spread way out. So they discussed after 100 billion years, uh, the universe is 500 times bigger than it is now. So the cosmic microwave background temperature is only 5 millikelvin. And that means you wouldn't be able to see it. The local group has all combined into a super duper galaxy, one great big galaxy. All the other galaxies have accelerated, expanded so far that they're very faint and impossible to see. 
So then we'd be back at the Captain universe. So if we wait 100 billion years, astronomers working then wouldn't be able to tell that there was an expanding universe out there. Just to show this, you know, here's, here's where we are now. And just 36 billion years later, we're up here. And this is our past light cone. This galaxy is now 3.4 billion light years away when we see it, which is here. And then 36 billion years later, we can watch down here. But we don't see it here. We, you know, it's way out here how we measure the distance. We have to measure the distance at the same time. And then that's uh, 34 billion light years away. Of course, it's 10 times bigger. Um, but it's actually 625 times fainter. So it's very hard to see. So that's after 36 billion years. And if you go 100 billion years, you can't see anything. But it's not all the galaxies go away. Anything that's gravitationally bound, here's an orbiting binary, sticks together. And in fact, all the galaxies would collapse into a single great big super galaxy. And then you wouldn't be able to tell anything beyond that galaxy. You'd study that galaxy, and that would be it. So that's the end of the universe, the end of cosmology. And this is the end of my talk. So if you're interested in more information, Videocassette copies of this program are available for purchase from the UCLA Instructional Media Library. Call toll-free 1-877-958-2200. Additional information about the people, places, and ideas discussed in this program is available at our website, www.webcast.ucla.edu.